Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics Podcast and viewers. If you are watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Good. I've just been thinking about running for Pope, so I'm just... Um, yeah, well, just good luck to you. That. Yeah, we, you can we do will. That, uh, right? Do you run for Pope, or is that not how it works? Um, well, there has to be like a primary, I think, and then okay. and then after the primary, you go into the general uh, policy. Well, as long so, as I have your vote and the vote of our uh, guest today, I'll be okay. I think. Yeah, and speaking of our guest today, it is is a man by the name of Ethan Chorin. Um, he was one of a handful of U.S. diplomats posted to Libya in the wake of the rapprochement with Mr. Colonel Gaddafi. Um, six years later, he was actually in Benghazi and was planning to meet with the Ambassador Chris Stevens uh, prior to the attack of the consulate there and the CIA annex and is out with a new book called Benghazi, a new history of the fiasco that pushed America and its world to the brink. So welcome to the show, Ethan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're really excited uh, to have you here, especially because... You know, we are coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the Benghazi attack, um, which, um, you know, very, very unfortunately killed um, not only the ambassador, Chris Stevens, but Sean Smith, Glenn Doherty, Tyrone Woods, um, you know, all all service members that, you know, just just served their duty and and passed away. So I think uh, I well, I, I'm really excited about what, what you're going to be bringing to us uh, here today. So. So I guess maybe maybe just to start us off first, um, I don't think I probably did a good jazz, good job, you know, thoroughly articulating kind of your background, your experience. Um, so maybe you can just tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Well, I have had a uh, career as a an economist, uh, diplomat for a few years, and a corporate person uh, based uh, in. Um, all around the Middle East, basically, for the last 30 years. So I haven't had a very standard career, but um, <laughs> I'm still still looking for one. But uh, <laughs> Libya has, has taken up a lot of my time for the last an interest and love for the last 15 years. And um, yeah, um, I have to say, I've been I've been somewhat obsessed with Libya for the last uh, last many years. And um, uh, I started out as a, as you mentioned, a diplomat and posted to Tripoli back in 2004 for a couple of years. And then when the Libyan revolution broke out, I felt myself sort of sucked back in. Um, I had a lot of Libyan friends who were calling and assuming that I was still working for the State Department and had all kinds of quandaries. And I felt like, um, you know, maybe, maybe the, my country might, might, might need me back there. So I... Mm -hmm. Called up uh, Christopher Stevens at the time, who was uh, um, had just been named uh, U.S. envoy after the U.S. intervention in Libya, um, and uh, you know basically he told me and 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 asked him you know uh, said I would be very very keen to come and work for you, um, and he said uh, he reminded me that the procedures in the State Department were pretty uh, long. <laughs> Long, so if I if I put in for Libya, I'd probably be sent to Venezuela two years later um, <laughs> by the logic of the department. So um, I and a uh, Libyan American colleague decided that we were going to try to bring American uh, medical assistance to Eastern Libya during the revolution. So we both basically quit what we were doing and had this crazy idea. In retrospect, it really was quite crazy of going back to, to Benghazi and um, making linkages between American teaching hospitals and uh, local um, medical facilities, um, particularly the Benghazi Medical Center, which was a 1,500-bed hospital that had been built by Muammar Gaddafi years before, I think in the late, originally in the late 80s, and had been uh, basically left majority unoccupied since then. Um, and uh, so we partnered with them and we brought a couple of uh, distinguished American uh, entities into uh, into Libya and we were making some progress when the Benghazi attack hit. Um, and yeah. that was really, uh, that had a tremendous impact on me um, in, on all levels. Yeah, I'd imagine. And, you know, and it's, um, 
I'm assuming, and and we'll we'll get in more into this. You know, one of the reasons you chose to write the book, but I'm, you know, for for a lay observer that only knows Benghazi through the lens of politics. Um, w- w- what else can you tell us about Libya? You know, the people of Libya, um, and maybe more. Um, narrow, you know, the, the people, the community of Benghazi. Um, and you can, you can use both, you know, pre and post Gaddafi if, if it, if it helps. Well, I think one of the, uh, interesting or relevant facts about essentially, uh, or factors in, in why Benghazi took on such a huge life of its own, uh, was the fact that, uh, most Americans know very little about Libya and, and, or, Benghazi. So it was sort of the perfect canvas upon which uh, to, to, you know, all, all sides to paint the worst image of, of the other. Um, uh, and, you know, Libya in general, I think if, if Americans have some sense of it, that it usually comes from uh, the personality of its, uh, of its former dictator, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and his very flamboyant uh, and at times lethal uh, lash-outs like the uh, Lockerbie bombing of 1988 that killed uh, a total of 270 people um, and uh, uh, various other, you know, the implica- implications in the Labelle disco bombings and the Vienna, Vienna airport uh, attacks and things like this. I mean, Gaddafi had gone from a populist uh, leader to a, uh, a rather ruthless uh, dictator. Um, and so those are the images that, that people in America t- tend to have of Libya and the famous confrontation between Gaddafi and Ronald Reagan, where the two would basically insult each other back and forth. Uh, Gaddafi called uh, Reagan called Gaddafi the mad dog of the Middle East, and uh, Gaddafi called him some much more interesting <laughs> things that I can't repeat. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you know it's a it's a hu- you know it's it's a huge it's a huge country, and the vast majority of it is desert. Uh, so most people think, ah, Libya, it's a big desert, um, but without realizing that most of the population actually lives along the coast in towns that are really quite lush and remind you of uh, of you know, one of Greece or or Northern California, where I'm originally from. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an amazing country with lots of really fascinating and beautiful, uh, sites, um, and cultural, uh, distinguishing cultural features that, uh, you know, are, are, again, are not that well known in the States. Um, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. as we were, what's, what's the language? Uh, Arabic, um, there, uh, Arabic. Ber- Berber, Berber is also a uh, language you're also spoken, but, um, the vast majority. The vast majority of people speak uh, Arabic. Uh, everybody speaks Arabic. Uh, there are a few holdouts that uh, older, older generation that still speak Italian from the days of the uh, uh, colonial period. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a fair number of people speak English, but that's not totally common. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. So, so getting to your book, um, you know, as I mentioned, kind of at the top, we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of, of the, of the Benghazi attack. And I'm, you know, I, I'm curious, like, why, why did you feel you needed to write this book, you know, and maybe more specifically, why did you feel you needed to write this book, you know, kind of in this period of time, um, 10 years afterwards? Well, actually, I've been trying to write the book for a number of years, and uh, there simply wasn't an audience <laughs> for it. I mean, I tried to, uh, the book got rejected an, an, a number of times for uh, two, two reasons that keep coming to mind. One is that it was too controversial, and the other was that uh, nobody's interested. And I kept trying to say, well, that, those two things don't really uh, add up. If it's controversial, people would want to talk about it, and, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, I, th- I think at this point, there's a, a uh, uh, 10 years later, there's uh, perhaps a bit, a bit more uh, of an appetite to look back at things that we, m- many of us have wanted to, to forget or, or we're just fed up with. And, and so there's an, op- I, I think there's an opening now. Um, there have been some other attempts as well to start to, uh, to try to, to, to cast a new, new, new look, look again at, at, at the Benghazi attack. Uh, and its consequences. Um, but that's basically it. I mean, I think that one of the major uh, 
it's not quite an uh, paradoxes of Benghazi was that there was so much noise um, emitted around this, this scandal and it lasted for so long. I mean, four, four years and people are still mentioning it uh, in, in various circumstances. Um, and yet we know, you know, many of the questions we had then haven't really been satisfactorily satisfactory answered now. Um, and it's not that there don't exist answers. It's just that the partisan uh, muck has made it impossible to, to, to look at, at this, this event, which by any objective standard is a major event in, in American history, um, regardless of what, you, what side of the, of the aisle you're on. Um, uh, and I think it's really important to understand, first of all, where it came from, which we haven't really, really haven't gotten much into, and what the, maybe more so, what the consequences are since then, particularly for uh, our lives today. I mean, it, it, people uh, get a lot of reactions when I say that, to, that we're living in a world that Benghazi, Benghazi helped create. Um, but if you look deep, deep enough, you, you'll, you, know, you can see the, the connections between the partisan uh, gridlock that we're in now and uh, that period of time in which Benghazi was a major feature. Um, and our foreign policy also has been affected uh, much more than people realize by Benghazi. Um, there's something in the beltway that people call uh, the Benghazi effect, um, which essentially is, boils down to a, a, a huge degree of, of risk aversion. Uh, nobody wants to be responsible for starting another, another partisan brawl over uh, 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 you know, uh, Americans killed abroad. So we withdrew many of our spies and our diplomats and retreated back, back behind walls and uh, relied increasingly on remote warfare, uh, which has had other, you know, it's not like that wasn't a trend that was already underway, but we've sort of uh, put on more armor and retreated from situations that, you know, you, again, you can argue whether, uh, people will argue whether we should be in the Middle East at all. Um, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I would argue that, uh, a lot of conflicts that, that, that it, it will pull us back in almost no matter what, if you look at the crisis in, 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 uh, in Ukraine, that is connected to the Middle East in various ways. Um, we're still not, in, we're still not, uh, energy independent, um, as much as we would like to say we are. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can give a number of other examples, but, um, uh, it was a significant no, event. I, th I, th I think consequences. Yeah, it it totally sounds like it was. Go ahead, Will. No, no, I, I was, I was, I was done. Go ahead. It's all you. Oh yeah, no, you're good. It, it totally sounds like it was such a um, like a significant event, especially within the Beltway. And I, I grew up in Washington D.C. We're not in there, but but by there, in Fairfax County, Virginia. And my dad was born in Washington D.C. And so. I always grew up around, you know, that center of power and all the politics there and all the stuff and knowing people that were, you know, in the CIA and FBI and, or, you know, they, you know, they knew diplomats and all this stuff. And so it just is a reminder. It kind of, it kind of reminds me of how, you know, growing up and thinking about, you know, all the people that are in my high school, whose parents like worked in those situations and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I didn't even know that Benghazi was a city until it, it happened, right? I mean, I had no idea Benghazi was a place um, on, yeah. you know, on this planet until sure a lot of people <laughs> still, this, still don't, still this don't event know. happened. It's... Yeah, I, I don't even, I, I, you know, I don't know much about Benghazi, obviously. Um, but what, what I would ask is that um, what... You know, what was the situation? Because everything is contextual, right? We know that. What is the situation that led up to the actual day of Benghazi? We're going to take some time um, in a few moments to kind of dig into the actual day itself. But what I'm wondering about is what is what was the context of the situation? Like, I know you took several trips to Libya and you're part of that, right, With, in the diplomatic efforts of the United States. So what... What was the context going up there geopolitically and what, who, and, and especially help us understand um, Gaddafi. Who, who is this guy? Um, what happened there? How did he change Libya? Um, what, you know, because us, we just hear him and we see pictures of him and he just almost looks like a caricature. He just almost looks like, um, 
like I don't know, like something you'd see, like yeah, on like one of these movies that's making fun of dictators, and he's like a dictator that come like, like a drive out on like a movies that make fun of tank. <laughs> he probably was. So what 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 was it about him? Who is this guy? How did he come to power? What did he do? How did he shape this place? Well, it's a good it's a good question. Um, I think if if you're looking at where Benghazi came from. Yeah, most directly, it came from the way that the United States and Gaddafi interacted with one another. Gaddafi, as I mentioned before, came to power as, as a virtual unknown, an army, army uh, sort of lower level army, army uh, uh, officer who, who uh, basically had a, staged a coup in 1969 against uh, a, uh, a, a, the Libya's monarch at the time, Id Idris I. And um, uh, you know, pe Libyans didn't know a whole lot about him, but he, he tied his star to that of uh, the immensely popular at the time uh, populist uh, nationalist leader, uh, Gamal Ab Abdel Nasser. Um, and uh, he had some quirky things about, you know, his, his, his manifesto, uh, which was later quasi-formalized into something called the Green Book, which is a very tiny, tiny book. Um, uh he, he his program was something something uh, like a mix of uh, of socialism and uh, 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 I don't know and, and nationalism and various other isms all all stirred into into one. Um, uh, one of a very well known Libyan author friend of mine used to call it you know sort of a stew of high school ideas. But uh, Gaddafi was not was by by no means an idiot. Uh, he was very he was he was very intelligent uh, in a number of uh, certainly in a number of ways. Uh, he was very good at being able to read people and and uh, sort of almost unconsciously steer them to do things that that he wanted them to do. Um, as I guess it's a power that many dictators uh, uh, have, uh, but he was particularly good at it. Um, and he survived for a long time by basically creating lots and lots of disturbances and kind of like uh, circus rings that would distract everyone from everyone else and most importantly him. Um, and the problem was that as the years went by and particularly with respect to international relations, the more kind of very... Uh, uh, shocking uh, uh, um, t uh, state-sponsored terrorist acts that he, he that he propagated. The more um, difficult that, that those acts were to control, um, uh, those those th that chaos. So there's just chaos swirling everywhere, and at some point you just can't handle the chaos anymore. Um, and after the United States invaded Iraq. Uh, in 2003, Gaddafi was certain that uh, he was next on the list for um, overthrow, and uh, the U.S. actually, the U.S. actually, he was not even on the top 10 <laughs> list, U.S. list for overthrow at the time. Um, but uh, as the the Iraq War became more and more um, unstable, uh, uh, Libya became very quickly a place where it looked to the Bush administration like. The United States could redeem some of the things that weren't going so well in Libya. Um, one of them was a win on the we weapons of mass destruction. Gaddafi had a kind of quasi, kind of erector set version of nuclear weapons that that he that had. Uh, um, yeah, but he was far from a nuclear weapon, but he had something he could call an, uh, a weapons of mass destruction program, including some chemical precursors for chemical weapons. Um, and he was willing to give that up in, or in, in exchange for um, ties with, with, uh, with the United States. And there were various parts of this, of this negotiation, but uh, there was also the opportunity for American oil companies to come in and get concessions that were, that were hard to come by in Iraq at that time. Um, and, and the United States could score a, say it scored a win for democracy, that now Gaddafi is embarking on this new reform program, and it's all because of this of the dominoes that were set in motion by the Iraq war. So that was sort of the sub, this, ar this argument wasn't really articulated that clearly by the Bush administration, but it was lurking behind the, behind the scenes. And um, so that was the context in which I was sent there originally to help open the first office uh, there. Um, and again, I can give you tons of really strange and weird and in some ways wonderful anecdotes, um, but that'll take, take a while. 
Um, How about one? Give us one. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, there's just you'd be surprised. You'd walk it around, and it's just like you, you knew that Gaddafi was wacky, and there were all kinds. And the, but the wackiness was everywhere, even where you weren't looking for it. I mean, I remember walking. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, at one point during on the anniversary of, of Gaddafi's uh, coup. I was walking through Green Square, where uh, you know, which is sort of the place where he would go to give speeches, and you know, the, the centerpiece of, of, of the capital of Tripoli. Tripoli. And um, all of a sudden, this parade came out of nowhere with uh, these flatbed trucks on which were chained, like uh, if I remember correctly, twenty ostriches that were just sort of swaying or swaying back and forth, and these <laughs> giant like cardboard <laughs> cutout of uh, like. Uh, I guess, but of refrigerators that were, and it was an advertisement for the national supply company that made or imported refrigerators. And then you had the like national women's core of veterinary, veterinary assistants, which were, you know, this, this another truck full of women in uniforms, you know, carrying uh, goats and things. And I was like, where did this come from? And I saw these people, uh, you know, on, on the side watching this and laughing uh, and, and, and I was like, well, they're not Libyan because they wouldn't dare laugh at, 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 at this production. And I asked them where they were from. They said, oh, we're Tunisian. Tunisia is the next door country. And we come here every day to watch this ridiculousness. <laughs> um, so that's one, that's, that's one thing you just, there were lots of, and, uh, uh, it was, a, it was, it was a wacky environment, but to put it, put it mildly. Um, that's, that's really funny. So, so it's amazing. Oh, go, 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 go ahead, Ethan. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I sort of got lost to where, 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 where we were in this thread. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, oh, the I, other, I think another, we, we another, could... another anecdote, oh, I should probably, you know, Gaddafi would give these commands performance speeches and one of my, uh, nobody in the mission wanted to go to these things because it would take two days to get to his, uh, sort of informal capital at CERT on the mid middle coast. And, um, uh, the, you'd have to get, to get there, you'd have to have to take a, one of, I think a third, um, oldest, uh, 727, uh, which was, had been retrofitted with, uh, parts from other, other, other countries like the Soviet, uh, parts and things like this. <laughs> and, it, you know, nobody wanted to do this and we'd have to like congregate on the, on the tarmac for like three hours and wait there in sweltering heat and then go, and then we'd be flown to this place and then driven around in a, in a, uh, uh, a bus with drapes on it. So you couldn't see outside, even though we knew we were going and then sit there and wait for another five hours while or maybe three hours while, uh, Gaddafi readied himself to give a talk. And then you had the Gaddafi speeches themselves, which were interminable. And, uh, but while he was speaking, you'd have, uh, and the, and the speech would take place in this black marble hall that was built by the Italians uh, for him. Um, and, um, he had uh, one of his his sort of chief of protocol uh, had a huge whip, uh, and ev ev if anybody the, the the hall was filled with Libyans, you know, basically who were supposed to jump up and say how much they they appreciated their leader, and if they didn't jump up fast enough, the whip whip guy would come along. He was dressed in like this Sergeant Pepper outfit, I'd come by and just like crack the whip. <laughs> People would be screaming. Uh, so it, it, it <laughs> You know, I, I, everything was a spectacle. Uh, <laughs> I, feel, I, I feel like after seeing that, you 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 might have given Josh some ideas. You know, because he <laughs> he pastors a church, so I'm sure that you know any and all the ideas are are uh, you know <laughs> are considered. But but, uh, but oh, go, I think go, you were, go, you were, go you were ahead, asking me where how how this uh, all Benghazi came about uh, and and how the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. interactions led to this. And this is a really strange story because in the, in the, and, and it's, I, I cover this at length in the book, but, uh, the, the highlights are, um, you know, in the eighties and, and, and nineties and nineties, particularly, uh, the Gaddafi was really persona non grata in the United States and Europe for his obvious, for basically Lockerbie was, was, was very high up there. The, the, the bombing of the Pan Am jetliner over Scotland. Um, and, at the time, Gaddafi's biggest enemies were uh, foreign fighters or, or Libyan fighters who had been trained in Af Afghanistan and who were coming back and uh, re reassembling themselves to, to try to get back at, at Gaddafi. And they were uh, almost successful on a number of number of times. And the United Kingdom had engaged a few of, with this group um, to uh, and 
this is a, a sort of a longstanding, never quite proven, but pretty close uh, uh, issue with the with MI6 and uh, in, in the UK, and essentially the the UK government was 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 paying some of these individuals to um, support their attempts to kill Gaddafi. Um, so the US, it's unclear exactly whether, you know, we probably knew about it and we may have supported it in some way, but um, in any case, we and many European countries were very, and many Arab countries were, would have been very happy to get rid of Gaddafi at that point. Uh, and we're relying on, on essentially the ex-Mujahideen to, um, uh, to, to do this. And then, of course, 9-11 came, uh, came about, and uh, that kind of alliance was no longer even remotely uh, con uh, able to be considered. Um, and, in fact, the, the U.S. Uh, put together a program to essentially kidnap these, many of these people. They'd, ar they'd already gone back to, their to you know, uh, Afghanistan and, and, and were fleeing from there. Um, to kidnap them and render them back to Gaddafi for torture and, and interrogation, and it seems much of the torture and interrogation was actually done by the Americans, not not the the Libyans. <laughs> they they probably engaged wow. in, in some of that too. So you had all of these people who had been, you know, originally had been we'd sort of been been favorable to or sort of arm's length connections with, who uh, we had uh, then you know essentially done these awful things to. And then, and of course, and, and I think part of the, the idea uh, at that time was, okay, um, you know, obviously these people might have information about Al-Qaeda and uh, it fit very well with the war on terror, et cetera. Um, and there was some notion that if Gaddafi's regime was to survive as a more open society, uh, they would he would need to make amends with these people in some way. So there was a... Uh, and he'd done sort of maneuvers like this before. So, and at the time, the United States was also looking into, um, you know, programs in various other Middle Eastern countries on how to essentially rehabilitate uh, 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 radical uh, uh, Islamists. Um, so this was going on over the course of like 2004 to 2008, nine, uh, you know, the... Uh, the, the renderings took place in mainly 2004, 2005, and then there was this reconciliation process that went on for uh, a number of years, uh, first tentatively and then more and more more quickly. So you had this strange situation where these guys who were former allies, former enemies, now were kind of back in touch with them and, and, and friendly to some degree. Um, and that's when the Arab Spring hit and the you know, the Libyan revolution uh, explodes. And we have no idea who, who's who in this mix. I mean, some of them were some of the rebels were Islamists. Some of them were were secular rebels or former former Gaddafi. Uh, I shouldn't say secular, but non non extremists, more moderates, more polit politically open uh, mm -hmm. to the West. Um, and. You know, I think there was a short window where the United States, if we'd committed sufficient resources, could actually have uh, turned Libya uh, into, put it on a more, much more stable path. But we, but we, the, the nature of the intervention by the United States in Libya made sure that they essentially, and the and and Europe uh, and the international community, uh, made sure that uh, essentially the situation was left highly fluid and unstable. Many of these individuals who, uh, I mean, after the intervention, essentially, Libya started to come, uh, I don't know, there were sort of two, two factions. One, you know, everyone was trying to create the vision of their, their own vision of the future Libya. And these visions were very much at odds with um, each other, but at least one of them was very much at odds with what the United States wanted to see there. So this is the backdrop to, you know, essentially a year and a half after the revolution, that's when Benghazi, the Benghazi attack hit. And many of these individuals um, understood that the more uh, that if they attacked the United States, uh, they would get much more leeway to to, uh, to essentially turn Libya into the kind of place that they wanted, one which was would presumably be uh, much more uh, under uh, uh, Islamic law, uh, much more restricted. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is essentially the climate that produced Benghazi. Um, Chris Stevens was very much, I mean, you know, 
It's a, it, you know, it's tragic in a lot of ways because the United States really uh, had an opportunity to invest in infrastructure and build relationships with a country that, for the most part, was very pro-American uh, and 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 really desperate to see opportunities uh, come out of you know after years of being uh, of 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 essentially. Uh, being frozen under the under the Qaddafi regime, it's a very young country as well, uh, um, and not uh, not ex- for, for, for the most part not not uh, uh, extremist. Um, but but that long period of neglect and the war that came after the intervention essentially helped um, radicalize even even more people, um, and. Yeah. I mean, Chris Stevens understood, I think, understood some of the dark side of the, of the history with, with, uh, with Gaddafi. And, uh, and he was also uh, an, an, ide- much, you know, an idealist. Uh, he um, felt uh, it very important to, he, he advocated for the intervention. Um, I don't know if that background is familiar. Um, you know, essentially, we intervened in Libya because Gaddafi had threatened to essentially pulverize the city of Benghazi. Um, and uh, the Obama administration essentially at the last minute was convinced that, um, you know, we couldn't let another massacre, you know, a genocidal action take place under our watch. So we did it, but we did it with conditions, and essentially, and later it was described much to the Obama administration's uh, uh, displeasure as leading from behind, that, you know, we could um, do things somewhat remotely and give, empower local local, um, um, populations to act in their own interest, um, but we weren't going to put boots on the ground. But what we did was effectively repeat the mistake of Iraq, which was to leave a giant political vacuum, uh, which then was open for a free-for-all, in which those are our, our potential allies and our potential adversaries just jumped right in. Um, so that's the, yeah, so, that's the so is it, or... Yes? Yeah, is, it, is part of our, our intervention kind of a response to... Because I, because I, if I heard you right, you know we we wanted to intervene because we feared there was a massacre. But like at the same time, if I recall or I got my facts straight, like Gaddafi um, pushed this huge like anti-drug thing, right? Where he basically was killing off his people, going I think whatever it was like house to house, door to door, person by person, um, if yes, they were as as you know speech. drug users or pushers. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, um, you know, the, the, the people and his generals all resigned and they, that's kind of when they decided to go after him. Um, so, so is that one, like, is my recollection of the events accurate? And then two, was that the reason that, you know, America, you know, created a, a, a consulate or, or, um, or something there? Well, there was never a consulate there. We've been trying to establish a consulate in, in Benghazi since the time I was there, but there was never enough sort of interest in, in or or the perceived right circumstances to do that. Chris Stevens was pushing very hard to have a consulate there because that would mean there would be, there would be an official pre- presence in Benghazi rather than what we had, which was sort of, a, a, I don't know, a, an outpost, a, a poorly poorly guarded outpost. Um, and that was another one of the reasons that he wanted to be there during that period of time around 9-11 was because there was a window in which he felt that there could be uh, more, much more higher level attention paid to, to that endeavor. To, that with a, a consulate, an official consulate came money, resources, attention, which was not there then. Um, as far as Qaddafi, I mean, you know, uh, Qaddafi, uh, no one really expected the, that Qaddafi would, many Libyans did not expect that Qaddafi would be able, would be hurt by the Arab Spring. They thought he was just too, too powerful. But again, here's where the past U- U.S. interventions, uh, the non-military interventions in Libya had an impact because essentially by agreeing to the reform processes and helping rehabilitate some of these uh, these individuals that I mentioned earlier with more radical views, Gaddafi opened himself up to more, uh, he was more vulnerable. Um, and people had been trained in, you know, some people had become visible to an extent that they could actually pose a, uh, a threat to him in terms of their popularity. I mean, Gaddafi always guarded 
uh, fame and 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 uh, visibility to him for himself because he didn't want anybody to challenge him. This process kind of basically weakened him, uh, and he felt that the United States had basically turned their back on him. Um, of course, he did lots of things which were incredibly provocative and which upset the State Department and everyone else. Um, so, uh, you know, um, what we didn't do is create some kind of a, uh, a, a lo- an emergency equivalent to a hotline where, you know, uh, things were starting to were going downhill really fast. Both sides could talk to each other in some reasonable way. There was just no communication. And that led to, you know, things just spiraling out of control. I think Gaddafi basically thought that the United States would never really turn completely against him. And he was also he was also clearly just uh, at the clearly towards the end just panicked, like what what do I what do I do with this? And dictators when they're panicked typically do some pretty crazy crazy stuff, and that's what we're, that's what we were worried about. Um, yeah. So, so and, and the, 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 the drug issue there was okay. I think there was a there was a big movement in the international community. Get, lots of people hated Gaddafi, um, uh, and there was certainly an exaggeration of the uh, of some of the of the acts that were attributed to him at the beginning of the revolution. There was you know this idea that he was feeding Viagra to, to soldiers. I'm sure that's what you're you're referencing, and um, and and telling yeah. them to go out and rape rape and pillage. Uh, that has been proven uh, or shown in in, the, in in you know after that to have been uh, basically not not uh, not in the realm of. It's certainly not complete, tr- not tr- not uh, fully true. Um, whether there was something that that might have resembled something like that on a minor scale, who knows? But basically, the main the the the, the calls that Gaddafi was 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 committing atrocities on a large scale in Tripoli were largely inaccurate. Um, but his threat to Benghazi, uh, which was the house by house, street by street speech, was actually more much more credible. And anybody you ask him, and I've interviewed tons of people in, in, in Benghazi, you know, scores, uh, and from different different backgrounds. And, you know, without an exception, all of these people who were contacts of mine before said, look, uh, if, if, uh, if, if the international community had, hadn't intervened, we would have been, you know, Benghazi would have, been, would have seen some really horrible stuff. Um, there was one uh, elderly gentleman that mm-hmm. I knew. Um, who who said that he was you know he was prepared he didn't leave many many people left Benghazi fearing the the imminent attack and he said no I wasn't going to leave you know an old old man I'm going to sit here and defend my shop until I'm dead um, and uh, yeah I mean at the very last minute the the French and the NATO US came in and and uh, and prevented that from happening of course the, then the concern among people like Defense Secretary uh, Gates was, well, okay, what do we do next? Uh, we've defended Benghazi, but are we, are, you know, these things tend to go into mission creep, and then are we, are we comfortable with, with uh, basically overthrowing the, the, the sitting leader of a, of a foreign country? Um, which, of course, is what happened. Um, and then what? Are we, are we going to commit <laughs> yeah. resources to help this country put itself back together what? again? Well, <laughs> nobody really thought about mm-hmm. that. And President Obama later, you know, said in, in one of his interviews with the uh, New York Times that uh, this uh, Libya was and, and what to do next was one of his biggest the biggest regrets of his presidency. What I don't think he really quite explained, or at least later, was exactly how bad a, a misstep uh, that was because it it led to Benghazi, which led to other things. Uh, and I would yeah. assert that I think one thing which I think uh, would uh, highlight is that a lot of people felt that after the Benghazi scandal. Uh, uh, you know that it was it was some it, the the scandal was a, a non-event that a lot of noise uh, a lot of accusations but in the end of the day it really wasn't very effective in doing anything but making people you know in the immediate term mad at each other and um, but that uh, say uh, Secretary Clinton Hillary Clinton's loss uh, had to do with all kinds of other things well it didn't it didn't if you i think uh, i did a number of interviews with senior um democratic uh, officials who were you know in the obama administration and out and asked them you know a few years later what do you think of the impact of benghazi on the 2016 election and they were very clear that you know essentially as one as one the person who, whose name you'd recognize um said you know of course it had a it had a huge it had a huge impact you, all you have to do is look at hillary clinton's email scandal 
and go go down the line. Benghazi was like the common denominator for for almost every single other fact that the factor that wasn't sort of demographic and other, you know that that uh, was blamed for for Benghazi, including mm -hmm. the Russian cyber attacks, which used Benghazi memes and and slogans and such as as feedstock. So regardless of what you think of of uh, of uh, you know it. Nobody wants nobody wants to look at these things very very carefully for obvious reasons. I mean, the Democrats. The last thing the Democrats want to do is look at this and say, "Oh, uh, that's you know the, oh, that, that Benghazi actually really uh, had a, a ne really negative impact." And the Republicans also felt at some point that they had they had realized, uh, as many of their le leaders' statements uh, indicated, that they'd overreached, that they'd milked Benghazi for everything that they could, and were um, you know it was, wasn't useful anymore. And I have to say that, um, you know, j stepping back, one of my arguments in the book is that essentially the Benghazi scandal was the product of, of, of both parties. It wasn't just the, just the Republicans and it wasn't just the, so, certainly no one was saying it was just the Democrats, but that the left had a, 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 um, uh, something to do with that dynamic, sort of like a dysfunctional couple that's arguing back and forth about crazy stuff and then start, you know, and then, and then <laughs> set the house on fire. Um, but, uh, I think the Democrats were so concerned for so long that the Republicans, uh, were going to, uh, come back and use some nine 11 related event to hit them over the head that they became just, it was just sort of, uh, they retreated more and more into themselves and farther and farther away from the bureaucracies that were meant to, mm -hmm. to advise them. And this is a phenomenon that I think that has started with the Bush administration and every single successive administration has, has done something that has, that has increased uh, the gutting of American institutions to the point where, you know, then Trump sort of appears and walks in the door and, and um, <laughs> hold my beer. People, people blame, <laughs> blame everything on Trump. But the fact is that we created the conditions for Trump to walk into the White House and do what he did. And, and he was very clear about what he was going to do. So focusing, and this is one of my, sort of, that's why I think that looking at Benghazi is so important because it really illustrates the kind of dynamics that people just didn't, don't want to unpack and which are, are, are really extraordinarily toxic to, to, the, to, to, to this country. And we're, we're seeing the results yeah. of it around us. I mean, suppose, okay, if you say that, if you agree with the idea yeah. that Benghazi led to Trump, you know, in a very, or at least was a, was a substantial factor and that, um, contributing factor. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't irrelevant and it certainly, uh, was a, an event that, that helped polarize the American public. One of the things that I, uh, in the course of my research, I talked to a number of data scientists who uh, emphasized the fact that uh, if it weren't for that, that Benghazi occurred at a very critical moment in the evolution of social media, that essentially if it, if it had occurred six months before or four months before or something, social media would not have had the power to, uh, to polarize and, and hmm. silo and, and put people into silos that it did then. I mean, it was sort of like a, confluence of, of, of all of these factors that just blew up. And of course, there are other factors. It was wow. right on the edge of an election. It was uh, linked to 9-11. We didn't know what, you know, how deeply, or et cetera. And it was just a, you couldn't have built a machine to, to, to harm American domestic and foreign policy or put as much, throw as much uh, mm -hmm. wrenches into things as, as, as the Benghazi attack. I don't think that its perpetrators realize this to the full extent. But I do think that actually it went much deeper than, than anybody is willing to, uh, in terms of the, its intent, than um, many people are remotely willing to, to, to say. Yeah. Now, so, so I, I watch I watched the movie, right, 13 Hours. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a bit reluctant to watch it. Um, because I just thought, like, what I knew about Benghazi, I just thought, oh, it's just going to be a big political movie, you know. And um, um, but it was actually pretty good, and, and they they did a very good job, I think, of not necessarily politicizing the event. Although I feel sort of bad for that that chief of the of the annex there. Um, but um, I, I'm curious if if one you can kind of talk about 
you know, did did the movie um, accurately portray what happened there to the best of your ability or net best of your knowledge, you know, and then two, if it did, like, where exactly were you like when all of this was, was going down? Okay. Well, I don't agree with you about, uh, about 13 hours, the movie, I, I thought it was sort of something <laughs> of a travesty in the sense that on one hand, I'm sure that, you know, the book itself was, was actually, uh, quite useful. I mean, it was the, first person uh testimony of the people of the people who were on the ground in that in those firefights um and um i didn't i thought that that was relatively well modulated that it wasn't excessively political the 13 hours movie made took a lot of i mean i thought there was a really heavy subtext of partisanship there but they also took took pot shots of people like Chris Ambassador Stevens who was represent if you may recall was sort of portrayed as this cloud of head in the cloud idealist guy who didn't really realize that the noose was was uh, was tightening around him i mean that's just complete baloney um Chris Stevens was was much more aware of what was going on than than most many people in, even in the department give him credit for um and you know he'd got caught in it anyway so that's a, that's a whole other thing, but um, and the also I think that the general uh, flavor uh, of the movie was one of uh, making Benghazi look like a uh, rabbit warren of terrorists. Uh, that there's nothing redeeming about the city. Of course, the other thing is that the movie was shot in Malta, not not Benghazi for obvious reasons. And Malta is you know is a, you know and you see these large uh, uh, churches and basilicas in the back in the background. You know, you look at that, you know, I look at that and go, that's Malta, um, not, not, not Libya. Um, and yeah, so I'm not sure. I, I think that that, that movie did, did, did a lot of harm, um, in terms of the perception of, of the city of Benghazi and its, and its people, as you've mentioned before. Um, anyway, as far as, but from a, I mean, I would go back to the book. I think the book on what it's based is, uh, is a useful, uh, if, if very focused account of what happened uh, at, at the diplomatic mission and then the annex from the perspective of those who were engaged in the firefight. So uh, I, I, I think, you know, the book is a, is a solid contribution. Um, the movie, not so much, in my review. Um, I was, uh, I mean, I think, and that's sort of more broadly speaking, I think that's part of the issue with Benghazi, the whole Benghazi thing is that everybody's focused so, so detailed on, on the, Fire on what? Who did what at a very microscopic level? You know, when when the bullets were flying, but the context is completely yeah. missing. It's absent. It's not what happened before. Where, why are we there? Why is why was Stevens really you know there? What you know had this happened before? I mean, I you know when after ben, after the when Benghazi was happening, I kept having these flashbacks to the period that I was I was in, you know in the diplomatic mission in Tripoli seven years earlier, where we had no security. There were no, we were, you know, in the, in the, in the, we were living in a hotel, which was essentially the number one possible target in, in Libya. If somebody wanted to damage the, the, the new, uh, Libya, uh, America relationship. Um, and there were still like more, uh, these cables going back and forth saying, please, we need more, we meet, we need more, more support, et cetera. At the time, the assumption was Qaddafi had every interest to protect us and he had this like extensive security apparatus, et cetera. But you know, none of those things are fail safe and we had nobody basically. Um, so it was sort of a, 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 a deja vu in a lot of, in a lot of ways. I was thinking at one point of calling up Chris, Chris Stevens came after me and he, we were introduced by a colleague because he wanted to know what he was bidding or putting, putting his name forward for a, a senior position in the, in the, in the mission. And he wanted to know what my view was of, of, uh, and, um, one thing that I, uh, I was concerned about at the time was security. And that was seven years before. Anyway, so uh, your question was, where was I during all of this? I was, yeah. I was so Chris Stevens had invited me for dinner uh, with my, uh, some of my colleagues at the time um, that night. So, uh, and I, I remember when he asked me, he, he, uh, he said he couldn't leave the compound. And I knew immediately why it was the anniversary of 9-11. But I was, my first thought was, okay, I mean, it's, it's sort of... Uh, standard thing that people visiting a U.S. embassy or, or compound have a lot of eyes on them, too. And I was like, so, Chris, you know, we have you may have protection, but we we don't. And of course, little did I know how little protection he had. Um, 
And, you know, part of the issue there was that the, uh, not to, uh, was that the United States had, had engaged individuals of a, you know, related to a, to a militia that had connections with all of the stuff that I, I, I was talking about before. It just, you know, it, 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 the mind sort of boggles. Um, but I was at a hotel three, three, so I obviously I declined dinner and I was at a hotel about three kilometers away, which was sort of the main wow. uh, place where, uh, foreigners would come and where Chris Stevens uh, initially set up, uh, set up his, his office when he was, was envoy. Um, and, but you know, and we were, we were, uh, Originally, there, there were some weird things going on around the hotel at the time, at the time just before, and I'd gotten a call from uh, one of our coordinators at uh, Benghazi Medical Center who was saying something bizarre is going on at the at the mission. Did you hear anything? And I was like, no, but that doesn't sound good. Um, and I went back to talk to my colleagues, and all of a sudden we heard this huge explosion. And my first thought was, you know, if that if, if that's the what's going on at the mission, we're in serious trouble. Or they, they're in serious trouble. Then I called the mission and um, Chris's number and got uh, one of his, uh, uh, I can't remember actually whether it was Chris's number or one of his, I think it was his, uh, one of his uh, security people. And mm. they basically said, oh my God, we're under bleeping attack. Um, and we had a really, you know, it was a horrible night. Uh, the next morning, the Benghazi Medical Center people came and took us to uh, to the hospital, and it turned out that many of where we were supposed to meet Chris the next day, and uh, it turned out that essentially the, the hospital was you know had uh, lots of injured uh, and killed who were uh, friendlies and unfriendlies, and we were not supposed to like leave to go out because uh, no one wanted you know we were sort of in the in the middle of the aftermath of it. Um, and that most of the Americans had been, had been official Americans had been evacuated earlier in the day. So we had to find some way of getting to the airport. And yeah, I remember like sitting on the tarmac, uh, uh, our, our host did an amazing job of helping us get out, uh, safely. And, uh, I remember sitting on the tarmac waiting, for, waiting to hear whether we were going to be allowed to board the last commercial flight out for a few days and thinking, you know, shit, Benghazi. This is this is going to have reverberations that are going to go way beyond Benghazi. Yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know what to think, but I was thinking, you know, this is not going to be limited just to, uh, you know, an incident that's going to be uh, talked about for a few days and then disappear. Um, you knew, and I knew that. It, I mean, you knew of, from. Yeah. No, I, I knew that it meant that, that, and I was hoping that it didn't, but I knew that that it meant the end of U.S. presence in Libya, that we were going to get out of there, basically. We, we still maintained a presence in Tripoli for a, while, for a couple of years, but um, Benghazi, as one uh, uh, well-known uh, Middle East uh, analyst in D.C. said at one point, was the, uh, the factor that, that, that sent uh, Libya into a death spiral. I mean, essentially any hope that the transition Man. process or anything else would – would would pick up was just killed and uh and which is highly ironic of course because chris stevens was out there trying to prevent just that um and you know but it didn't stop there because of course the united states was the, the conflicts in libya and syria were connected the united states was essentially using proxies to arm uh rebels that were either moderate or extremist we didn't know basically of course we didn't didn't probably intentionally uh, arm ex the more extreme elements but we were it was a it was a soup that was where the connections were all over the place and once we retreated you know any sense of control of, of trying to control or understand what was going on went out the window and in the book i try to ask a bit more questions about okay how did that affect what was going on in syria at the time when benghazi hit uh, President Assad was hanging by a thread, and and Obama was saying, "Well, this is, you know, he's he's almost out of there." Then two months later, Assad is back in force, and you have all of these countries sending, uh, you know, huge amounts of arms and 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 uh, trainers and other and and money into the conflict because you know essentially, as I argue, they they realized that the United States wasn't going to take a position, so they better intervene uh, before be That's you know. amazing. So. And, yeah. people, and, you know, and I have to say that the, it, for, for all of the, the heaps of, of criticism of the, of the um, uh, Benghazi committee under Republican leadership, you know, and a lot of that, you've got, you know, it just, 
ninety percent or more of that was was political posturing, but um, they did try to 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 look more deeply into some of these things, like what what was what were the Syria links, and according to the to the transcripts uh, and, and report out, uh, you know, essentially they got they didn't get the answers that they the, to the questions that they asked, and that's a big that's still a big open so, question. And of course, one more thing is we oh, don't know. Totally. No one has ever been been no, actually. No, no. I mean. Two people were brought to the United States for, to, you know, basically kidnapped and taken to the United States and put on trial for Benghazi. Both of them were acquitted of the most serious charges against them, and the, the, um, we're still like obsessing about them, not who, you know, where did this, where did this, how far did this go up, and what are the, what are the connections between it and uh, other attacks that were attributed to the same to to associates of the same organization. Um, you know, it's just all of that's just kind of washed away. And maybe there's no, yeah, you know, deal. yeah, no, I Whoa. totally I, I hear. And this is a fascinating thing because you see the interconnection of all these different um, people and organizations and how miscommunication can happen and how decisions can be made. People trying to figure things out and then there's unknowns and there's unknown things that are happening because of course if we knew that on that day there was going to be this attack that would kill these people um, that were american citizens you would assume that we would have done something to really prevent that and so there's all these different things that are happening um that it creates this they can create this like um this this a lot of so with so many different things happening, the likelihood for someone to come in and say there's some conspiracy theory about it or how this was planned this by huge. the Obama administration or how I you know, I mean, it's huge and it's huge. And so help us kind of just like in a few like uh, moments here, like debunk some of you. What do you think kind of the major myths? that you've seen about Benghazi? Because on my end, all I heard was my conservative friends, which I'm very conservative, and that's. but all I heard about them was talking about how this shows that Hillary is evil, that she was trying to, you know, plan. I, I don't know. I mean, that they planned something, or Obama, this was all like, they shouldn't, he shouldn't be president because of this, and she shouldn't be president because they just let soldiers die, or she shouldn't yeah. be in a position... What are some of the myths, and you actually being there and being involved in this, what myths can you debunk as uh, maybe some of the major ones that came out around this? And I think maybe Will has another question after that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, like, like there's like a viral video or something. I've heard sort of that that conspiracy theory as well. Yeah, well, this was one of the major kind of uh, uh, issues with Benghazi really was the perfect scandal because there's so many – so little information about the, the setting, why people were there, who was doing what. It's in a country far away that we know nothing about, and we're predisposed to think, you know, pretty horrible stuff about it. So, you know, of course, and, and who's going who's gonna to come back and say, you're wrong? Um, there are very few people who could do that. I mean, and, and this is one of the big sort of takeaways, I think, or should be, is that the United States really gets into these, these – uh, entanglements or these wars without really having the 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 capacity to understand what's going on on the ground and and it's a systematic level you have some very smart people in 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 many of the uh uh in in, in all of the bureaucracies with the cia the state department and nsa etc but um the process for getting that information the number of people who are actually on the ground and have information and the process of linking the people who have the information to those who are actually in a position to talk to policy leaders i mean all of that stuff has just been totally it's dysfunctional um and the united states can't survive with it with a system that that you know or at least be a global a, the undisputed world power you know, with with such an apparatus um in terms of of what's uh what what to be debunked you know um the way that i describe this is as you know basically the democrats and the republicans had two separate narratives that were constructed, both of them, to refute an attack, largely, you know, attack on the side of the Republicans and refute and dodge on the side of the of the of the Democrats. Um, and given that they were constructed in this way, it's not it's not surprising that their relationship to 
to fact is only you know partial. And I, would, I, I keep wanting to think what would happen if the Democrats and the Republicans were forced to essentially, by some neutral arbiter, to sit down and dissect all of the claims that were made and compare them. I think they'd both be sort of elated and deflated at the same time and might, might you know, this is a uh, pie in the sky, but might actually think, huh, um, you know, we can't talk about this anymore because we were both, we both messed up. Um, but the, uh, you know, I... I think that the Republicans were correct about uh, the Democrats' uh, unwillingness to uh, tackle Benghazi straight on and to reveal what they knew when. Um, I think the Democrats were absolutely right in, that, uh, in, in fearing that the, that the Republicans were going to attack them with whatever they had um, and thus were reluctant to do that. I don't think that the Democrats uh, and the Obama administrations started out with the intent to, to, to sort of cloud things, but I think it came in pretty quickly in the sense that they realized what, the longer that the stories set, the harder it was to go back from them. And I think that actually in this case, Hillary Clinton got, you know, sort of, it's one of the real short legs of the stick or whatever the uh, analogy is, um, in the sense that she was both had to support the Obama narrative and dodge and, and, and refute and, 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 and try to escape from the Republican attacks. So she kind of got sandwiched right in the, right in the middle between two, two, uh, two, ad, two adversaries in a way. Um, and she was the, you know, and everything else took off from there. I don't think, you know, my opinion of, of Hillary Clinton actually, uh, changed quite substantially during the course of doing research for the book. I, you know, sort of beginning w right after Benghazi, I felt like I was walking in a, you know, I was in an aquarium watching strange creatures uh, talk about things that had very little to do with what I had just witnessed. And, um, you know, I, I sort of counted Clinton as one of, one of them, one of the people that was just sort of saying what she, you know, taking taking some of those strange opinions but you know the more i the more i the more people i talked to who worked for her you know i i, I think she did the best she could under the under in, in many ways under this under this, under the circumstances um she cared she she uh she ever people described her as being you know constantly on top of the issues she uh she told me and in i interviewed her um and uh you know she she said that she really felt that there was a lot more we could have done in libya um, and one has to ask the question, okay, well, you know, um, many people, uh, Chris Stevens and, uh, and Clinton included were, were saying we need more resources and the white house was saying, you know, no, we don't want to go full bore on, on Libya. So, um, I don't know if that answers your, your question, but, um, and I think, you know, yeah. all of the, many of the things, you know, many of the more preposterous things came, came at Clinton. Um, you know, this, the, the, and you have to say that the, the, I'm not sure I have time to sort of methodically go, go by point by point, but it was clear <laughs> that, that, that she was a very easy target. Um, and it fit, you know, demonizing Clinton basically fit with everything else that, that, uh, uh, you know, if you want to, if, if you, if you, at, at some point the scandal became irrevocably political and both sides were just doing whatever they could to, you know, in, in a kind of primal sense to it, to, to kill or not be killed. Um, and you know, once you, the problem is that once you have some vagueness and suspicion within the public, as you said before, it allows all kinds of other much more unlikely things to come into play. And then you get, and it, and it blows, it blows up and blows up. And then you add to it, what I was saying before about the social media kind of propensity to take those things and then immediately polarize, uh, the, the audiences. And you've got, you've got something that's a, a major, major problem. And we're still, we can't talk about this today because in part, because of the polarization of, of, of that was, helped along. I mean, I'm not saying that Benghazi was the root of, of, of everything we're talking, we're, we're experiencing today politically and uh, in the realm of foreign affairs, but it had a lot more impact than anybody is, is sort of feels allowed to give it credit for, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. And so, 
Yeah, um, if if you've got a little a little bit more time, uh, we we have a, f- a few more questions, and I do I just want to be sensitive to to your time. Uh, so oh, sure. if, if you have to leave or, or whatever. Okay. okay, good. Yeah. So so I I'm curious. So from what I understand, it was the attack was conducted by Al Qaeda, and I'm sure maybe some other faction. So again, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but if if it was Al Qaeda, like why? Like why attack like that outpost and the annex? I mean, what were we were we just easy targets, you know, or was there something about our occupation there that really, you know, kind of set like those factions off? Well, as I uh so there's never been a kind of a formal uh readout on in in detail uh, in terms of who who committed that crime um and the uh, you know i think there's, there there was a consensus within a few weeks within the intelligence community that in fact it was a terrorist attack uh and that ansar al sharia uh it was uh, was impl- was implicated uh, ansar al sharia had se- had two different branches within libya um, and uh, had an affiliates in in, uh, in places like uh, Yemen originally, where the sort of the overwhelming, overarching concept came for for it, and in Tunisia, where there was a, an attack uh, a couple of days after Benghazi, which was immediately attributed to uh, to Ansar al-Sharia and Al Qaeda by association. We also know that uh, many th- there, there's evidence that that a, a number of, of, of analysts in the intelligence community understood that uh, Al Qaeda was before the attack that Al Qaeda was trying to essentially penetrate uh, infiltrate Benghazi using uh, Ansar al Sharia as the uh, front organization. So when 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 with all of those uh, and and that, and that was essentially and that's an established uh, fact. Um, so. There was a lot of debate over, okay, was this Al Qaeda or was it not a, not Al Qaeda? But that's that was largely political because it depends on who you know who you think is is Al Qaeda. Um, but uh, and as far as um, you know, why then and uh, and how much planning w- went went behind it? Um, you know, I uh, that's still not particularly clear. Clear it, it, clearly, it would be in the interest of. Uh, of Al Qaeda to uh, to uh, to to stage an attack like that, whether by you know a, a high command or uh, as an opportunistic attack by a local affiliate, because uh, you do something like that, and the chances of of, of that some chaos w- w- will ensue are pretty great, and that's exactly what that's exactly what happened. I mean, the parallel that many people have used is that of the. Uh, 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 bombing of the U.S. Uh, Marine barracks in Beirut in 1983, where one, in that case, it was an Iranian-backed um, uh, a militia that, uh, you know, killed uh, two, uh, upwards of 200 uh, service people uh, and forced the, re- re- the, the reaction was essentially that the United States and much of the international community just left, which allowed for more of the same, that those groups then then essentially uh, were able to to uh, to stage uh, uh, to prolong the Lebanese civil war and uh, and and turn the tables towards their own interests um, so one of the things that I was very interested that I was very interested in is is how uh, is the connection between the various attacks there were a number if you recall a number of different attacks on US embassies and uh, consulates in the in the vicinity, I would guess of the larger maybe yeah. Muslim world, and they were all attributed to this uh, video uh, that, if you recall, and, and many of the debates or the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the antagon- antagonism between Democrats and Republicans was around. You know, was this was this attack caused by a video, which was the the Obama administration had initially hinted uh, and and. And said in, in its talking points, or was it a, a premeditated attack? Now, uh, the reason for believing that it was a video, as of course, is by a direct association with an attack that occurred uh, a few hours before in Cairo, where there was a, a, a large demonstration outside the embassy, and uh, followed by a uh, breaching of the of, of, of parts of the of the, of the compound. Um, it's a violent, att- essentially a, a, a devolved violent attack. Um, 
and it's really not clear. You know, the the the, the thing that interests that that, is, that has interested me since not long after the attack was whether the video itself was used as a kind of spark you know, or a signal by 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 Al Qaeda to essentially, you know, uh, say. Uh, you know, uh, to alert some of its more organized subsidiaries that uh, to cause various types of chaos. You had a lot of sort of copycat uh, activity where people were just randomly assembling in front of instead of embassies and American interests, but uh, you did not have um, you did have a number of more calculated uh, uh, and violent attacks on a number of installations where groups like Ansar Sharia were were present. So you can't, and, and one thing that I found in many of my interviews was that many of the principal officers at the posts that were under attack really had not been brought together with other principal officers to compare notes. And of course, you know, it took us two weeks to get into, ben to have, or two, over two weeks for the, for the FBI to actually go into Benghazi and, and, and look at what was, you know, uh, and, and start some kind of an investigation, but by which time the, the, the um, you know the, the premises were were contaminated certainly um yeah it's it's uh yeah uh, well <laughs> real, real real quick just just for those that aren't familiar the video that that ethan's talking about is i, I think it was like a 14 minute like anti-muslim um video that ended up on youtube for some period of time or something is that is that correct or is there another video um that's out there, Ethan. No, that was the video. The video was a, a uh, an excerpt from a much longer video. It was really an awful anti, you know, to the very poorly made uh, anti, you know, hate hate speech, uh, where you know all of the characters spoke in New York accents, and uh, uh, you know it, it, it defamed the the Prophet Muhammad, and and uh, you know it was just some, something you'd look at and say, okay, this is this is clearly not a. Uh, it meant it's clearly meant to uh, to antagonize whoever was, was watching it, um, and that and the question that the, the provenance of that video is also s not completely clear. I mean, who it it, it, it surfaced uh, you know a few a few weeks before the attack, um, and the people associated with it, you know there's a there's a, an argument to be made. And certainly, it hasn't been proven that the that the video was sort of a uh, uh, itself a, a, a part of the effort to uh, prime the, the 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 people who would be offended by it to go out and 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 uh, protest or, uh, or 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 attack uh, things on the on the anniversary of nine eleven. So uh, the Obama huh. administration presented the movie as a kind of an accidental. Deus Ex Machina, you know, something that was not under our, it was, it was a, an act of God, not to, <laughs> um, uh, and, and we were just sure. responding to it. The question is, you know, was, was the video actually part of an, part of a perhaps sloppily, perhaps not constructed effort to, um, uh, to lay the groundwork for the kinds of things that we saw in Benghazi? Um, and uh, you know, it's, there are other interesting things. The uh, 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 leader of uh, uh, you know, the successor to, to uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, Ayman Zawahiri, was uh, appeared the day before the attack to urge his uh, uh, in a in a in a, a, an online letter to urge his uh, followers to avenge the death of a his number two who had who had been killed in. Hmm. Uh, and up, uh, outer regions of Pakistan uh, several uh, months before. Um, and his brother uh, was uh, implicated in the uh, uh, organization of the protests in Cairo. So the question, you know, all of these sort of simultaneous threads that suggest that, you hmm. know, possibly it wasn't all random. Although, you know, it. it yeah. No one's proved this, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, we don't know yet, but certainly, you know, you could see that. Um, you know, one thing that comes on my mind, just as I'm, I'm, I'm putting all this together, because obviously it's always more complicated and so, um, so much deeper and 
you know, not as simple as we want to make it out to be very complex, these situations, um, all these different moving parts going on, all these different motivations. And as I'm hearing this, I'm just thinking about our own, like, our own propensity to misunderstand things, um, our own propensity to off, you know, to, to act rather out of assumptions rather than anything known to us or any kind of factual information many times in our, in our propensity to jump to conclusions. And I was thinking about that, like, man, what a, what a good lesson, you know, about, about not jumping to all these things. And, and I was wondering, what do you, from all of your information that you've gathered and all of the um, interviews that you've done and the people that you've talked to uh, in the research for your books, um, what lessons do you think you've learned about human interaction, about how we conduct our business as Americans or just as citizens of the world? What information have you learned about human nature? Whatever, what what are the largest lessons that have come out to you? Maybe surprising, maybe unintended, but what lessons have come out of this research that you feel like you would want to share to our listeners? Well, uh, one is certainly that you know we have this tendency to believe that um, that, that things happen because uh, somebody has decided to. Uh, that it should be so. And, uh, you know, and often, often that is in support of some conspiracy theory that this couldn't, you know, uh, there's no way this could be, could be random or that there's no way that the United States could be so incompetent or, uh, not understand X, Y, and Z that we're all, all power, all, all knowing and all, all in some ways, all powerful. Um, certainly with, with respect to the, like the stand down order con controversy, which we didn't really get into, but the, the accusation that various individuals within the US government, the Obama administration basically, you know, failed to, to act. Uh, I know, I think that that uh, can be debunked, but you know, essentially, the problem there was not uh, lack of, 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 of wanting to do something as much as the lack of prepared, you know, a flexibility within the the organizations that were meant to 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 act, and you know, or maybe the you know, so I, I think one 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 lesson is that you know, things can be uh, things are very complicated, and um, uh, yeah, I think there's an there's a tendency for for Americans to believe that 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 we can solve all problems. Uh, and that that if we fail to solve a problem, it's because of an ill intention on the part of somebody. And I think that is that is absolutely, you know, what is it? The uh, uh, Occam's razor uh, idea that, you know, the, the most likely thing is the most sim simple. It's it's usually because the you know, the, often it's because the, the bureaucracy simply couldn't uh, couldn't cope with it or some, some, you know, or it was just bad timing or something. Um, so despite the, the, the uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to see conspiracy theories everywhere, but often it's just simply an imperfection or a, uh, a lack of, um, uh, of, of communication. Um, and, but at the same time, it's a big, you know, in this case, it's in, in the case of Benghazi, these are big red flags. If we have so much miscommunication, and, and the bureaucracies are not speaking, the, and the intelligence and security agencies aren't speaking to one another, and the president is spending so much time basically uh, worry, trying to fight off anticipated attacks instead of uh, pouring resources into uh, restructuring and beefing up our capacities to detect them in the first place, um, that's a big problem. Um, and I think that the Benghazi attack and, and others before it were all – uh, kind of warnings that we, we really need to look at the uh, at, at, at the structure of, of government and how politics has uh, de has has eroded it. Um, so that's that's uh, that, that's one. Um, in terms of uh, I don't know. The other thing is that you know I, I I honestly think after after speaking to so many people on the right and the left that you know most people are 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 basically want to do the right thing and are. 
they're certainly conditioned by by what the people around them uh, say, uh, and um, you know this the, the the way that American society is structured these days. There aren't that many often opportunities to to, to hear or or experience another perspective. And uh, I mean, that's one thing that I actually mentioned in the book is, you know, I feel particularly uh, lucky in the sense that I grew up in a very sort of diverse uh, environment in, in Berkeley, California, the, the capital of, of, of left wing America. And, um, uh, you know, I was exposed to a lot from a, from a really young age. And then I had the... Uh, uh, the privilege to be to, to to travel and live in other countries like Yemen and uh, you know and uh, and Jordan and Tunisia on U.S. government fellowships. Uh, I mean, I think the Fulbright program is an amazing uh, uh, tool, which is always under 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 funding uh, attack. But uh, you know, you take somebody and you send them to another country for a year and and have them live with other other people who have different perspectives, and that can't Help, can't uh, help but improve their tolerance and ability to to see the bigger picture. And that's what we need these days is wow. much more. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. So, um, so kind of as we wrap up here, <clears throat> you know, if I am a reader coming into this book blind, you know, maybe not hearing this interview or having one, view about, you know, Benghazi, you know, left or right. Um, what, what am I the reader going to walk away, um, thinking about Benghazi? Well, hopefully, uh, my, 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 my hope is that the reader will come away, uh, from this believing that in fact, Benghazi was a significant historical event that uh, it, it was it, it emerged from uh, a, a series of other uh, decisions that were taken uh, at various levels of the U.S. government, and that it had very significant impacts on how we uh, on on both American um, just the tenor of American political discourse these days, but also specific conflicts like what happened to Libya, what happened you know in in in, in other areas in the in the region, and. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, I, I've tried to be as balanced as I possibly can. I hopefully I've been able to sort of um, debunk some of the the grand conspiracy theories, but point to a plausible way that all of this unraveled. That you know, where there's a you can sort of see where the where the conspiracy things th th came from, but there are other bigger lessons. Like let's fix this stuff so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, that, that, that's so awesome. So, so this, this, uh, pod will be released, um, on Tuesday, September 6th, which, um, so we're recording this on September 5th, 5th. Um, so, um, where, where can people get it, get the book, um, learn more about you, um, and, and anything else that, that you can, you can tell us, you know, where we can make sure that the word gets out about this book. Okay. Well, thank you. This is, this is the book. Um, <laughs> although I, I'm not sure it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of striking design. Um, uh, uh it's, it's on Amazon. Um, and, uh, it's in, um, uh, bookstores near you. Um, it should be fairly easy to get, uh, hopefully. Um, I'm curious. I don't know what the reaction is going to be. It's, uh, you know, again, it's one of this, it's, it's, it's perplexing. It's one of these issues that, you know, people, you know, it, have most likely heard about, but at the same time have very complex, I think, fe feelings about. Um, so we'll, we'll see. But yeah. hopefully it, it helps I, uh, in, in, in inform people. I should also say that a lot of the, I, you know, a good part of the book is written in, in, in first person. So I talk about, you know, what I was experiencing at different points during this whole, whole story. It's not just dry, uh, policy or hopefully it's not dry. Um, but it's, it really is, uh, a lot of it is my own sort of testimony. The things that I w wasn't able to say when, when, uh, when I couldn't get a word in ed edgewise. Oh, that, well, uh, we really appreciate you one writing the book and then coming um, on our show to talk about it. Um, you know, Benghazi is for me anyways, has always been one of those hot button political issues that I don't know. I mean, that I, 
don't have a strong opinion one way or another, with the exception of, you know, anytime we lose American lives overseas, it, it, it should make everybody pause to just think like, was our mission, our operation in that particular area necessary? Um, so sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is no. Um, and, and I think Benghazi is one of those, one of those situations where I just, I didn't know enough about what we were doing there to really have an opinion one way or another. So, um, so I, I appreciate you, uh, you, you know, kind of giving us your, your first yeah. account. Um, it's been really, really helpful. And, uh, yeah, and I, I wish you good luck with, with the sales and, you know, looking towards that New York times bestseller list, right? Yes. <laughs> your dog agrees it's with me. Definitely agrees. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that, thank you very much. We will see you all next week. You Thanks, too. Thank you Bob. for having me.